What is up guys? This is a no bullshit conceptual followed by code based understanding of what asynchronous programming is, what multi threading is and what multi processing is. As I always do, we will start with an intuitive conceptual understanding of what these three paradigms are, followed by some Python code to cement those ideas. So let's start with some concepts. The first one asynchronous programming. Let's take a very simple day to day example here. You're in your kitchen and you want to make coffee and toast for yourself. You have a coffee machine and of course you also have a toaster. Method one, you go to the coffee machine with a mug, you press the button, wait for the coffee to pour and after that you have your cup of coffee. You then go to the toaster, put in bread, wait for the toaster to get done and then you have your toast. This is standard synchronous programming where you wait for your task one to complete and then you begin task two and then task two completes. But there is another method here. Idea two. You go to your coffee machine with your mug, press the button. While the coffee machine is pouring coffee, you go to the toaster, put in bread. Both these machines right now are working. You have some spare time because you're waiting for the both of them to get done. You can do whatever you want. You can clean your kitchen, do whatever you want. And while you're busy, once these machines are done, you collect these items once you hear that beep and move on with your life. Idea two is asynchronous programming. If I read this in a very technical term, asynchronous programming is used for non-blocking IO tasks that can be started and the code flow instead of waiting can move to other things as well. Now, this essentially means that the CPU needs no utilization for these tasks. So if you're doing it synchronously, it is just waiting, right? Because even if we were getting coffee and just waiting for the machine to pour coffee, we are waiting, we are wasting our time. So that is asynchronous programming. Let's now move on to multi-threading. Take another scenario again. Let's say you are in your kitchen and you want to dice onions and tomatoes. Idea one, completely dice onions. Once you're done, completely dice tomatoes. And then you're done. So this is again sequential. Idea two, dice a subset of your onions followed by a subset of your tomatoes, then switch back and then back again. And this back and forth will eventually get done and you will have all your onions diced and all your tomatoes diced. This is multi-threading. Now you might ask me, what is the advantage of using multi-threading in this case? Because you will essentially take the same amount of time. You are one person, you are switching between the tasks, but the total time taken should be the same. You're right. But bear with me for the concept right now. The idea is if you have only one resource or one code in a computer, or in this case, just one person, multi-threading isn't giving you much if this is a non-blocking call in the technical sense. For that, you need multi-processing, but more on that in a bit. Multi-threading for a single core in the technical programming terms is used when you have a blocking IO call where the CPU is not involved, but it is blocked. So you can switch to something else while the IO system or some other device that is connected via IO to the CPU is doing the job and the CPU can do something else. But of course, if the CPU needs to be busy to do it and it is either not an IO call, let's say the CPU is doing something, then there's no point in switching. So the use case is very important in programming and I think in life, the use case decides what you need to do. In the use case where you have blocking IO calls, where some other device needs to do the processing, you can use multi-threading where you use a thread to ask one device to do something. Let's say a camera is connected to your CPU and the camera needs to do something. Then you can ask the camera using IO to do something while you're doing something else on the CPU. But essentially this example where you're dicing tomatoes followed by onions, then tomatoes and onions again is multi-threading. Now I said that multi-threading doesn't help with this. What are we going to do then? multi-processing comes into play here. So let's talk about multi-processing as a concept. Let's say you are in your kitchen and again, you want to dice tomatoes and onions. What if you hire two people, person one is dicing onions, person two is dicing tomatoes. That's it, right? This is multi-processing where you actually have parallel processing. So you have two resources working on two different processes. And these processes do not share their resources, by the way. In this example, they are not sharing their knives or the dicing board, right? So if I read, technically, it says multiprocessing is used when you have multiple resource intensive tasks and want true parallelism. This is a very hard word, parallelism. Each task is run in a separate process with no common address space or resource. Because as I said, in the naive example, you are not sharing your dicing board, you're not sharing your knife, right? So that is the idea behind multi-processing. So conceptually, we've understood what is asynchronous programming. 
what is multi-threading and what is multi-processing without even looking at code. That's why I love intuitive conceptual explanations so that we understand what the idea is without throwing jargons at each other. Now, we know about these three concepts. Let's code and see how to implement this. Of course, this is gonna be a basic implementation exercise and you can build on top of that. So let's look at Python and implement a simple example for asynchronous programming followed by multi-threading and followed by multi-processing. We will compare the performance of specially multi-threading and multi-processing with normal sequential execution so that you understand where multi-processing works, where multi-threading works. Okay, let's go to code. Now, with the conceptual understanding of what is asynchronous programming, what is multi-threading, and what is multi-processing, let's look at some code in Python as simpler examples to understand this in action. The first one is asynchronous programming. Let's look at this code. But before that, let's understand some basic terminologies here. In this code for async programming in Python, we are using the library called async.io. If you don't know what this library is, please Google search and check out what this library is all about. But essentially, it is for asynchronous programming in Python. The first one is the keyword async. Async is used to make the function asynchronous, that is to define an asynchronous coroutine. The next one is await. Await is used to suspend the execution of an asynchronous coroutine until the result is available. When you need to perform an asynchronous operation that could take some time, for example, reading from a file or making a network request, you use the await keyword before the function call. And then we have asyncio.gather. This is a function provided by the Python asyncio library that allows you to execute multiple async tasks concurrently. It's useful when you have several coroutines and you want to run them concurrently, waiting for all of them to complete. It takes multiple awaitable coroutines as its arguments and returns a new awaitable object that represents the combined result of all the input awaitables. It doesn't wait for each awaitable to complete one by one. Instead, it runs them concurrently, which can lead to improved performance for IO bound operations. The last one is asyncio.run. This is a function provided by the Python asyncio library to run an asynchronous function or coroutine as the main entry point of a program. Okay. With the basic keywords out of our way, let's look at the code. The first two lines are just for import. Lines 5 to 8 define an asynchronous function that prints 1 and 2 with an async sleep in between. Here, asyncio.sleep with the argument 1 is just to simulate an IO bound task that the CPU is just waiting on. In your real program, you will await for a genuine IO bound task and the CPU will wait on that. Line 11 and 12 is simply defining an asynchronous main function that asynchronously calls an awaitable object, which is essentially three counter instances in this case. So you have three instances of this async counter. This chunk between line 14 to 19 is just for your standard entry point in Python. Here you have your start time and end time to log how much time it takes for this async IO run to complete. And then we are printing this execution time. Let's run this and see how much time it takes to actually run this program. If you run this program, you see one being printed twice and two being printed twice, but you don't see one and two followed by one and two and then again one and two because this is asynchronous programming. So you see three one because each async function has been called and then two once every async function is done. The total execution time is 1.002 because of course they are not run one after the other. If that were the case, we would have had three seconds, right? Now, this is asynchronous programming. We already have the conceptual understanding of asynchronous programming. Next, let's look at multi-threading. In this code base, we are using the library threading and we will compare sequential execution with multi-threading. This file doesn't have any new fancy Python programming. It's quite basic. So let's look at the code directly and we will explain new parts as and when they come. This is where you're importing a library. This is the loop length. I will show you where you use this loop length later on. The chunk between line seven and 19 defines three simple functions that do nothing but keep the CPU busy for loop length cycles. And each method keeps the CPU busy for that loop length. So essentially these are mock functions to keep the CPU busy. And we use that to later see how this is executed and how much time it takes when it comes to multi-threading versus sequential programming. I'm gonna remove the terminal for now. Now lines 22 to 30 define a simple sequential execution function for the methods above. This is nothing special. We just need this for comparison. So in this case, method one is executed followed by method two and followed by method three. We also then print the time taken in this method. Now line 33 to 52 is a function where you're actually using multi-threading. So you are creating different threads and you start those threads. 
you see how much time it takes for this entire chunk to complete. But instead of running these methods sequentially, you run them in different threads. So simply put, this chunk defines a function that uses multi-threading to execute these three functions. We first create the three threads using threading.thread. We then start these three threads using start. With join, the main thread will wait for thread 1 to finish first, then wait for thread 2, and finally wait for thread 3. Only after all these three threads have completed their execution, does the code flow move on to the next line where you are actually printing multi-threading execution time. And this chunk is standard execution entry point that first executes sequential execution, followed by multi-threading execution. So we can actually compare the performance real time. Let's run this code and see what happens. Upon running this code, you see the following. These values will vary based on the CPU, but the trend will be the same. Now you might ask, why is multi-threading execution time greater than sequential? Well, that's because multi-threading on a single core is not the right solution if your threads are CPU intensive, and we are using a single core for multi-threading here. What is the solution for that? multiprocessing. If we can run these different methods or different functions in different processes, we are actually truly parallel. So next we will also see that. But before that, there's something interesting to know. The global interpreter lock called GIL in Python only allows one thread to execute at a time on a single core. So multi-threading here just increases the overhead of context switching with no improvements at all. That's why in this particular case, if the three functions had intensive blocking IO bound tasks, multi-threading would have helped, but we don't have that. That's why multi-threading doesn't help in this case. So for this, the solution is multi-processing. Let's move on to multi-processing and compare it with everything we have, which is sequential and multi-threading. This file builds on top of what we already had in our multi-threading file and compares sequential execution, multi-threading execution, and multi-processing execution so that we can compare the execution within one run itself here. Most of this code is the same as multi-threading, but you of course import multi-processing library here. The loop length and the three functions are the same, although I've written method here, but of course it is a function that goes without saying. Your sequential execution stays the same as the previous example for multi-threading. Your multi-threading execution, again, is the same. It's just here so that we can compare. This is a new chunk where you are actually using multi-processing. This defines a function that uses multi-processing to execute the three functions. Apply async submits a function for parallel execution in a pool of worker processes. It is non-blocking and doesn't wait for the result immediately, but returns an object that you can use to obtain the result later. The get method of the objects is then used to retrieve the results. This part is blocking and it waits until the result is available. This is again where we log the time for multiprocessing. And the last part is simple. It's just to run all these three functions. The first one is for sequential execution. You log the time and print the time. The second one is for multi-threading and the last one is for multiprocessing. If we run this code, we can see the performance of these three options. So let's do that and compare the results. Upon running this code, you get the following results. These values again will vary based on the CPU, but the trend will still remain the same. Now looking at sequential execution time, this has the worst performance. The next one is multi-threading execution time. Of course, it depends on the CPU and sometimes it can happen that this value is very close to sequential execution time for a simple example like this, because context switching is not super heavy. But as context switching gets heavier, multi-threading, if it is not the right tool, can become very slow. The third one is multiprocessing. You see that multiprocessing here is the most efficient option. That is because this case was suited for multiprocessing. Multiprocessing sped up everything significantly. Thus, multiprocessing is a star for parallel CPU intensive work. But bear in mind that processes do not share resources and address spaces. They have their own resources and address spaces. Well, if you need to pass information between processes, you have something called inter-process communication, which can use shared memory or message passing. Message passing is something that is used in robot operating system a lot, but that's for another time. So as a summary, we saw what asynchronous programming, multi-threading and multi-processing mean conceptually, followed by simple Python implementations for each. I hope this video was helpful to you in understanding what asynchronous programming, what multiprocessing and what multi-threading is in Python. This was still a simple video just to explain the idea and all of this stuff is used heavily in Python programming and of course the general concept is used everywhere in programming. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.